Hey everyone and welcome back to another episode of the Brickwork Podcast. Today we are very excited to have David Senden and Marissa Kasdan from KTGY joining us here today. David Senden is the principal and also on the board of directors of KTGY. Uh, David has projects that range in residential and mixed use across the United States but also internationally. Um, David also has projects that have to do with affordable housing, campus housing, and recreational projects as well. Marissa Kasdan is the Director of Design at the R&D Studio at KTGY, and the R&D Studio is what shapes the discourse and concepts for new ideas and new concepts within uh, design at KTGY. We are also really excited to announce our new partnership with KTGY. We are now offering concept massing um, models with our brickwork reports, and they are available for an additional fee uh, for our pro users only. So if you would like any more information on becoming a pro user or ordering a concept asking model report, please feel free to reach out to us. You can reach out to us at contact at brickwork.la or visiting our website www.brickwork.la. Thank you guys again for joining us and let's get into the podcast. So hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of the Brickwork Podcast. I am super excited with our guests uh, today. Uh, it's something in the works and the making uh, for both of our firms, I, I would say, for the past few months. And uh, I think this is the official launch and the kickoff. So I want to uh, welcome David Senden, and I want to also welcome Marissa Kasdan from KTGY. How are you guys doing? Good, John. How are you doing? We're great. Awesome. Well, yeah, you know... Uh, Essentially, I think, David, we um, were introduced a couple months ago, and uh, I really love this kind of collaboration that we're, uh, we're going to kick off uh, uh, the launch for. But uh, yeah, so uh, if you want to kind of intro KTGY for our audience, I think uh, it's starting to grow. Majority uh, were commercial brokers in Los Angeles, but uh, we're starting to kind of widen that net. So we're getting, you know, vendors from, uh, you know, everyone that has a say in development is starting to kind of watch these podcasts or be our users or, our, uh, uh, or viewers of our content and also obviously developers as well. Well, we've, uh, we've been certainly um, excited about getting to know Brick Plus work and, uh, and the fantastic work that you guys are doing. Um, for, for your audience, maybe that doesn't know KTGY, yes. we're about a 400 person strong firm with offices throughout the United States. Um, so offices, uh, a couple offices in Southern California, one in Northern California, one in Denver, Chicago, and Washington, DC, which um, gives us kind of a unique perspective on kind of trends and things that are happening across the country. Um, we do full service architecture firm from kind of the big fat pen initial sketches all the way through construction documents and then into the construction, the building and CA. Um, residential and commercial work both. Um, and so, you know, I'm excited about this, this partnership that we have going with you guys um, and your work in, in kind of automating the process of understanding the zoning in LA, which is um, a Byzantine adventure um, that we all know that um, if you can simplify that for anybody, that's wonderful. Um, and then there's always kind of that point at which um, you go through the zoning code and you find out what's allowable. And then that doesn't always translate perfectly into what's possible. And so um, I think that's where KTGY comes in because just because the zoning so code says that you can do it doesn't ne necessarily mean that it's physically possible to do it right. or practical to do it or um, you'd be in your right mind to actually do what the, what the zoning code says. So um, I think what we're, what we're launching here is um, the idea that we could take something um, jumping off from where brick, brick plus work um, ends mm -hmm. and do a massing model study kind of to talk about what the constraints um, actually mean in the physical context. So um, we're excited about that. We think we've got a, um, a pretty quick and easy way to get that done at a reasonable cost for your users. And, um, and we're really, um, yeah, I couldn't uh, be more excited about it. So um, we're we're happy. We've been in the beta test here for a while and having some good success with that. And I think you've heard some feedback for sure. And uh, we're hearing feedback. So uh, 
Absolutely. So uh, I just wanted to share, thank you so much again for being so open. But I, I think, um, be, you know, when we first launched this beta phase to now, you know, just um, really getting to know you guys at KTTY, I get why you were so open to this, right? So I think in kind of the spectrum of, uh, you know, other architecture firms around here and around the U.S., it seems like you guys are definitely forward thinking, right? I, I definitely do see that. I, I, I think you guys are looking at newer ways of, uh, of, of, of looking at development and design and, and kind of, you know, what new concepts are out there. So I'm excited. I'm excited for this uh, partnership. Yeah, well, that's a, that's a perfect segue when you start talking about, um, you know, looking forward. Um, we about five years ago, we sort of put our money where our mouth is and mm -hmm. said, if we're going to really be thought of as thought leaders out in the world, we need to devote some of our own time and energy, um, you know, without kind of a client in front of us, without a project immediately in front of us, how can we sort of reach out there um, a couple steps ahead of maybe where the market is to try right. to um, anticipate some things, get some conversations going, um, move the needle a little bit on, on, uh, on the discourse of architecture. And so we, we started this R&D studio and that's why the other, the, the other person is here on the screen, Marissa Kasdan um, heads up our R&D studio for us. And I think we've got uh, maybe a preview. I don't know if this is the first time this has been seen out in the world, but um, something that we're um, kind of excited about and is kind of timely here in this, in this pandemic world and thinking about um, how office space might transition in the future. Will there be the same um, level of need for it? Uh, will people be working at home? Are they gonna hot desk? What's gonna happen? Is there gonna be a glut of, of office space? And if there is a glut of office space, what could we do with that space? And so maybe, Marissa, maybe I just let you take it over and uh, explain what we've come up with maybe. Yeah, sure, David. So our new concept that we're just rolling out now, we're calling Flex Flats. Mm -hmm. And um, the idea was repurposing conventional office space for residential units. We started to see that some of the uh, office spaces were not, um, they were not performing as well as they maybe could be, especially in certain markets. And often in those markets, uh, they were also experiencing housing shortages. So, and these were trends that we were seeing well before COVID hit. And then when everybody got shifted to work from home, obviously this was on the forefront of everyone's mind. What does this mean for, for office space and, and how are we gonna adapt to this? So, um, so we wanted to take a, take a pass at, at what we thought that might look like. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the struggles often with converting office space to residential is just the size of the floor plate of that building. Mm -hmm. It's usually much deeper than what you would typically uh, have for a residential floor plate. You know, if, if you're thinking a, a typical residential unit might be 30 to 35 feet deep, and then you have your corridor and then another unit. So, so you're talking maybe like 70-ish feet deep. Uh, a typical office building would be much deeper than that. And so what you get are these sort of interior void spaces near the core, the core of the building. And mm -hmm. what do you do with that space? Does it just end up being this dead volume in the middle? And so we wanted to look at what those units might be that could be, um, a, a more efficient way of using that space. How could those be designed? And then also trying to work in some of the design trends we're seeing in uh, residential design. And for us, what that meant, especially in this post pandemic world was how can we create some additional flexibility in those spaces? And how can we adapt to the way that people are using their units? Um, we're having to use our homes in ways that we never imagined that we would. And, um, and also just the way that families are growing and changing in ways that maybe our housing, our housing isn't adapting to rapidly enough. Um, so being able to create flexibility in the units. And um, so that became a, a big component of this as well. Uh, so I don't know, would, would you like me to show some imagery of what, we, what yes. we've been working on here? We're excited to see this, absolutely. So this is just the exterior of our office space that we used as a prototype building. Mm -hmm. And as you can see, we tried to affect the exterior of the building as little as possible. We really wanted to see how we could make this be 
an economic option for being able to convert the, the, the office space. So we figured that removing and recreating the exterior facade would probably be a non-starter. So instead we try to keep the exterior facade as similar to pre-existing as possible. And we did, as you can see, incorporate operable windows just to work better with the residential use. We've also added uh, a residential lobby at the ground floor and then a small a residential um, amenity at, on the roof deck. I see that, yeah. And so, oh wow, okay, so that's kind of the before. Um, These are the before images of the okay. office space, um, both before the tenant improvement and then as a functioning office. So you can see it's just a, a pretty standard office building with a 30 foot column grid and uh, some nice high ceilings. Some of the features of these office spaces make them actually very, uh, they make some really nice residential spaces because you have those high ceilings that you typically don't get in a residential building. Agreed. And this is just some diagrams showing mm -hmm. what we're proposing to keep and what we would add to those spaces. So the column grid and structural system obviously stays the same. You keep the vertical circulation as is. And then um, based on this prototype plan, we're seeing that we could get about 14 residential units per level. And so that's working within that 30 foot column grid and then varying the depths of the unit uh, as needed to provide some variation in the unit square footage and bedroom count. Mm -hmm. And then, as I said before, we added operable windows and then some other uh, residential features just to uh, help serve the, the, the community. So this is the pre-existing office plan with the desk layout. And then as we take that away, and then you can see we've put in residential units of varying depths with the fixed width fitting in that column grid. So what that meant for this is that the bedrooms became um, shifted back into the unit plan as opposed to being out at the exterior window facade. Right. So in order to, oh, so I'm going to show you, this is the section mm -hmm. and showing how those units work. We have uh, some existing office space on the ground floor and then the residential units above. And as we show this, I should just point out that this is the way that this concept works. Um, you could use this as part of a building with other functions as well. We're showing the top four floors as residential, but the way most of our developments work, they're all mixed use in some capacity. So mm -hmm. this could vary depending on the needs of the building that you're working with. And then just highlighting one of the units, um, I'm sh showing you some of the flexible spaces that I was talking about before where we're using some sliding walls to partition the spaces being able to create larger spaces or smaller spaces, depending on the function, the need at that moment or for that family. We've also worked in some of the other trends that we're seeing in residential design of the, those um, uh, mudroom spaces and package storage spaces that are starting to, to become more and more important. So here are some views of the inside oh, wow. and yeah. And as you can see, those walls move to be able to create some different sized spaces depending on, on how you need to use them. Mm -hmm. And then, like I was saying before, you get some really nice uh, high ceilings and some exposed ductwork and some of the elements that you don't normally see in residential design. We also worked in some high windows above the flex spaces so that you can get some additional natural light deeper into the units. That's one of the issues with these deep units is the natural light. So we yes. figured by putting in some high windows, you can help to, to add some light to deeper within. And then here's just that mudroom I was mentioning mm -hmm. in the package drop off yeah. right at the, at the front entrance. And those, those have like a door from both the corridor and the inside of the unit. So uh, management could potentially drop off the packages right at your front door and you can just get them from within your unit. 
And then another uh, variation that could be used, I mentioned that sometimes those deep spaces um, near the cores, hmm. uh, you end up with some sort of oddball areas. Right. And so we worked in like a, a small lounge at that, at that uh, elevator lobby. It's another way of taking up some space toward the middle of the unit. Yeah, that's great. Common areas, right, for, for that floor. Right. And that space could be programmed in other ways, too. Um, one of the other suggestions that we had was it could be rented out as storage lockers for the residents uh, to add a little um, extra, extra option. So that's the overview of the plan. We also have a short video that we could show. Yeah, let's do it. Marissa, uh, that is, is super awesome. How long have you guys uh, been working uh, on this concept? Well, we started studying some of these ideas of where we see some of the trends that were happening before COVID mm -hmm. at, um, that might last longer than just this time right now, um, as soon as we started going home. But then this, develop, this concept has been developed over the last few months. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Yeah, I think, you know, you know, John, I might, I might just mention that, you know, anytime we're doing the R&D stuff, it's really about the idea. It's not about the exact solution. And although we're showing pretty specific solution to this particular suburban office building, um, these ideas kind of work in a lot of different settings, could work in high rise, could work in other places. And I think that's really what this is about is not... Um, not having anybody look at these plans and go, well, that's not the size of the building that I'm dealing with. We, we, we have a little bit bigger one or we have a little bit smaller. One. That's not really the point of this. The point of it's more that it is possible. And so as, you know, and maybe it's the folks that you work with, the commercial brokers out there looking at these office buildings that they're struggling with, how are we ever going to fill this up? The, I, the, more it, the more to the point is, no, this is possible. This is another, maybe another arrow in the quiver of um, possible things that you could do with the building. That's that's kind of all um, that we're saying here. No, no, I, I can't agree more. And I think that's, uh, so I want to kind of uh, discuss some of the feedback and let our viewers know that don't, um, or uh, weren't offered this. Don't worry, it's going live 
uh, uh, very soon or almost now when this video goes out. So you will have access to this. So the feedback or what we did was we handpicked about 10 uh, users that were our pro users, you know, CBRE, Marcus Millichap, Lian Associates, kind of the top producing uh, agents in LA because we knew that they were gonna uh, um, really have a need for this, right? And so um, like David had mentioned before, um, Brickwork gets you so far. For land use, that's just kind of, you know, what we do is we give you the development potential, but now you have to take that next eventual step. And so this partnership with KPGI is now to look at a concept of physically masking it. But again, it requires the feedback from our users. Some of our users already have a developer in mind and they already have a direction in mind. Great, that makes it easier, I think, for KPGY to uh, you know, ask those specific questions on what, where you wanna see this, how do you wanna park it, how many units, what type of unit mix, unit size, like all of this stuff is a part of, you know, kind of our initial screening uh, questions that, that we provide. But then, you know, some of our agents and users go, I have no idea, I don't know. Like, <laughs> can you give us direction? Like, can you tell us based on your past projects or the comps in that specific neighborhood, what would be ideal? And I think that's been, also great is really lending on kind of the expertise of KTGY architects to come in and, and provide that guidance as well. So it's it's part and parcel. I think uh, if you have specific direction, we'll, okay, fine, we'll, we'll take that or we'll provide, you know, our kind of, uh, you know, what we feel or KTGY feels is, um, is might be ideal, but that again, could switch again. It's just uh, the next step or eventual step for due diligence. So, uh, yeah, I just wanted to let our viewers know we're going to be launching this uh, soon as well. And I think with Flex Flats as well, this whole, the commercial, and David, I want to throw this uh, back to you, is that so a, a lot of our uh, brokers are now seeing this big redevelopment play. Uh, Alex had mentioned uh, on land use that, you know, you know, at least for the city of LA, um, uh, you know, uh, obtaining an adaptive reuse is an entitlement, right? And so... But you do have to minimum, you know, you have to pass the minimum qualifications, you know, to be considered for that, right? And so we actually are going to start to provide that on the reports as well. And I think this hopefully can uh, lend more, uh, you know, projects your way so that they can take a look at this flex flat. Doesn't have to be exactly like this, but the idea and the concept is taking whatever existing space as an office and finding best case or best use or best design for that. So um, uh, I think you had mentioned, uh, you know, city of Irvine and some other municipalities um, is, is adaptive reuse kind of an entitlement for uh, city of Irvine or did they pass something where it's by right? You know, I, I honestly am not sure. Um, that's, that's, that's why we use people like you and Alex to, to help yeah, us exactly. with that. And I'm not sure in the city of Irvine. And it does vary depending on right. um, what city you're what city you're in and what's considered adaptive reuse and what's a by right entitlement. Right. And, um, and I think, yeah, you know, I think what we're seeing with most cities are a conversion to residential. Yeah. Um, is looked on favorably just mm -hmm. just for sheer fact that we have this housing crisis going on right now. Right. And so, um, you know, I, I guess Alex would be the one or you, you would be the one, John, to tell us whether that's an easier entitlement to get yeah. than, a, <laughs> than a, a, a ground up from something else. But, um, you know, it just seems like um, with the need for housing and if we're seeing the office market shrink a little bit and we were even seeing the office market shrink a little bit prior to the right. pandemic. So um, if those trends kind of follow, mm -hmm. um, then we're gonna have some buildings that are gonna need something done to them. And, right. and I think the idea, you know, you have a few choices, you, you keep them what they were, you knock them completely down or you adapt them to something else. Um, right. And so, you know, as people are running through their pro formas to see which one is the, the more likely um, and you know sort of highest and best use for that site, um, and we're we're just hoping that we've we've sort of got the tools as a firm mm. that we can kind of go any direction depending yeah. on what the site is telling us and what the what the easiest what the easiest path through the entitlements are and kind of what gives us that um, 
that highest and best use. Do you guys have any um, projects for Flex Flats right now, whether it's in Southern California or just any other kind of city that's uh, in, in progress or in process, or are you guys just announcing this now? Yeah, so we're, we're really just rolling this out as a concept right now. Over the years, and even now, we've had multiple de developers and building owners kind of nibbling around at this idea. I bet. Yeah. Um, and it's never quite, it's just never quite gelled. So nothing has gone forward. Now you can find all kinds of adaptive reuse in old historic buildings that yeah. have gone from yeah. office space to residential or or hospitality. Or, um, and so this idea is more about these kind of um, more typical office buildings that were, um, they're not historic. There's not anything that's particularly, um, uh, I don't know, architecturally significant and wonderful. Although you certainly can use this in those buildings too. But um, the idea was kind of, what do we do with these, with all of these suburban or, or sort of, uh, no, not not so great office buildings. How yeah. can we use any part of those things, or are we are we just you know do we have to just scrape it and knock it down? And there seems like just intuitively it seems like well you've already got this floor, the structural system, possibly an exterior skin. You've got elevators. You've got all of this stuff. Mm -hmm. Is there not a way to make that work for residential? And so you know as as this goes along, we've also got. We've got it out there in the world to some contractors trying to get some feedback on pricing too. Unfortunately, yeah. they weren't ready to go by the time we got to you guys. So we can't, we can't give you it because that's the next step of how much does it cost to right. convert an office building into residential. And so hopefully, and, and it's not our same cast of characters that we normally deal with in terms of contractors because, mm -hmm. um, you know, contractors that do ground up buildings, eh, maybe that's not the ones you want to use. So who we're talking to are, those guys that have typically done TI work yeah. um, and things like that so that they kind of understand how you have to work around things. And, uh, and so hopefully we'll have that information. Yeah, I, I, I love this because I think um, our partnership is naturally going to lend to more of these projects coming through. So uh, I, I think this is super important that we get this uh, information out there to the masses because I think, you know, uh, we talked about this all the time. Our users are brokers that are kind of the tip of the spear that are trying to put these um, uh, concepts and these ideas in front of property owners and developers, right? And not all developers are always thinking about what's the next new thing. There's a lot of them that kind of just get bogged down or into the same type of cookie cutter builds that they're used to as a certain ROI. They just want to do that at mass and scale. So we'd like to have impart some new ideas, right? And some new concepts in front of them so that they can also, you know, diversify their portfolio. Like I was in a, a call with um, Equity Residential and they were just like, look, we have too many assets that are urban core and we are actively looking for suburban or in the middle, there's going to be the second city. I mean, there's all these concepts and things that being thrown around because we don't know, right? We're just kind of trying to figure out what's going to, how it's going to take shape uh, in the next few years. But um, you definitely need to be ready for that. And I think um, uh, it's super important here. So Marissa, if you want to kind of, I I'm curious about, so uh, the, the design aspect. So is there, um, you know, because there's certain cities and municipalities with kind of design overlays. Do you think that kind of um, is going to come into, uh, you know, uh, play here when, when you look at more of these projects in, or is it has to be very site specific, right? I think you have to look at the overall, uh, you know, the land use and the, the, the overlays and the restrictions there, then to Certainly. adjust based on that, right? Certainly you'd have to look at, yeah, whatever overlays and, and what the city would allow and whatever site you were looking at, it, I'm sure it would vary greatly. Um, but, but as David said before, um, you know, we're seeing that need for housing is just so great in so many of these communities. Um, we think there's definitely an opportunity here for this. Absolutely. Yeah, I I can't say this enough. I definitely want to, um, and David, we need to talk offline, but I really feel we have to um, provide, I know we're doing the concept massing, but um, we're getting a lot of requests that are just commercial as well. So it, it's, uh, you know, hotel, whether it's office to housing or hotel to housing, there's this move for, you know, adaptive reuse or redevelopment. So we're getting this requests 
quite often is okay so is what is highest and best use can we only just keep it as is is it better to you know do ground up and demo the site or can we you know reuse the site so um this is going to be perfect we want to obviously share this uh with with you know our user base so um Okay, let's talk about kind of in the next coming year. So, um, uh, you know, uh, if housing is still, it, it's still an issue, right? It, we, are, we are woefully short on the goals that, um, you know, the governor has set for affordable units. And we're looking at, you know, uh, uh, the cost of construction going up, lumber, labor, land like all three of those pieces so don't you think that more of these developers that are trying to pencil things maybe at like you know they're not doing a six cap anymore they're looking at four cap or, or breaking even right so this would be the natural kind of thing to look for it's going to be less you know right costly and 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 uh, you know, when the numbers come out and they look at site specific with, with the GCs and the uh, research that you guys are doing, I, I would just imagine this would be the play to look at non-performing assets that are across the board. You know, it's been accelerant for a lot of portfolio to be non-performing, if that makes sense, right? And so I think developers should be looking to do more of these than, than ground up. Yeah, I think everything, you know, real estate just in general is so site specific. So yeah, I think there are, and I think that's what we like about what we do is that we're involved in projects, everything from these non-conforming kind of sites to more conforming sites with uh, um, maybe some innovation and in construction technology to help right. with that cost. Um, so you know, we're, we're working on this kind of adaptive reuse of office at the same time we're working on things like, um, you know, projects that involve modular housing, uh, for example, or employing mass timber or a proprietary steel system or other ways to just kind of leverage um, um, whatever that, the, that particular site's characteristics are. So, um, you know, if the zoning says that you can go high but you can't go high with wood construction because that's the thing that's cost effective. Maybe there's something between wood and um, a concrete high rise building. And maybe that's structural steel. Maybe that's a, a mass timber solution that gets you a little bit higher than. Um, so we, we just like to have all of those potential tools in our back pocket so that it sort of makes every site work um, uh, depending on kind of its own constraints. And so I think that's, that's what we would, I guess that's what we would tell um, the users here and your clients about is just, there's no site that's impossible. Like there's probably some solution to that site in there somewhere, um, but we're not in the typical world. So if you're, if you're going to use these old rules that you've used for, used for decades, then you're going to sort through a lot of sites and they're going to make no sense. But if you can have an open mind and think about some things like uh, the, the concept that Marissa showed or some other ideas for how you might um, get to the goal, um, you might have some better luck. Now that does take some pioneering thought sometimes from uh, some people and, you know, developers are not keen on taking a lot of risk always. So, um, you know, you need to always mitigate that. And we're architects. So we like to, um, we like to think big and stuff, but I think we, we try to understand kind of our clients, um, business practices and their goals and kind of, um, and while, while we love beautiful buildings, we love designing beautiful buildings, we know that somebody has to pay for them um, right. eventually. So uh, <laughs> we, we do keep that in mind kind of as we're going forward too. Yeah, I think uh, I even, even just starting Brickwork and just being around land use consultants and city planners, uh, uh, but now uh, with this collaboration, I'm really now seeing how difficult it is for, for architects as well for that balance of aesthetic and penciling, <laughs> yeah. essentially, it's that tightrope, right? And so sometimes, you know, these are your clients, so you have to kind of present options and then, you know, they are constrained by you know, capital and, and also uh, uh, ROI on those projects as well. But uh, no, I mean, I think this is exciting because 
I've said this uh, previously, I want Brickwork to scale and have an ability to go at the very minimum to the cities you guys have offices in, right? So LA is the starting uh, or jumpstart for us, but we'd love to be in, you know, Denver. We'd love to be in, you know, in, in DC and in, in other uh, Seattle and Portland, all these cities, because they themselves have similar but different constraints and challenges, right? With affordable housing and, and this rapid urbanization and how many people are sitting, are staying in the city, how many people are leaving and what's gonna be the new norm. So um, we wanna bring new entrants. That's what I've, that was my point is really these, I think if the barrier of entry is always just gonna be information and the people that take advantage of it have arbitrage and they just wanna build a certain type, we really wanna open the gate so that so many newer, uh, people can come and they want to build the things that you guys are designing, if that makes sense. We kind of want yeah. to do that. Yeah, well, and I think it's, I think the other thing that's interesting is, you know, many cities, um, and LA is definitely a more progressive one in terms of um, the planning department and kind of what they're, um, what they allow and what they don't. And right. um, I think right. obviously every site's different, but, you know, thinking about some of the things that have been baked into either the zoning code or, kind of planners brains um, uh, kind of leads to, and we can talk about this some other time, but um, you know, kind of on the, on the drawing boards right now is our next um, R and D project, which is, you know, re-envisioning that ground plane of what happens with the retail that is in so many of these buildings, because oh, you've got, man. you've got just retail and starting before the pandemic, but the pandemic being accelerator starting to, um, kind of close up retail. So what do you do with that ground plane at the sidewalk? And how do you activate that and make that interesting instead of a bunch of soaked up um, windows and uh, vacant vacant retail space? And so whether that's from a ground up standpoint of just programming that differently at the ground or, or again, the adaptive reuse of that ground floor plane um, and how that, how that all works out. So um, stay tuned for that. Marissa's, uh, Marissa's hard, at, hard at work on that right now. <laughs> All right. Well, look, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm really thankful uh, uh, to you guys at KTGY for even just being open to this, you know, collaboration, this partnership that we're starting for the uh, for a very fledging startup here in LA. But, you know, we do have big aspirations and goals to kind of be in the conversation for every city that is looking at development to kind of modernize it as far as at least bringing the barriers of entry down and the land use information up. And, you know, we don't just, it's not, you know, static information. We're constantly as city planners and land use consultants looking at what's coming, right? With what, uh, and obviously there's, like you had mentioned, David, LA and planning, <laughs> it's, a, it's quite a challenge, right? The politics are involved. There's a lot of things in play, but I'm almost positive every city has has that as well. So um, uh, I'm, I'm just excited that I think um, we align in that we're trying to bring fresh ideas with design, aesthetic to our urban cities or suburban, right? We're, we're just anybody that's looking at either housing, providing housing for their specific you know, neighborhoods and cities require, you know, these are, these are necessities, right? Is if you want to change kind of how, you know, uh, the look and, and feel and, and, and the neighborhoods and the cities, you have to understand what the land use information is, the zoning information, and then also uh, look at what physically is possible for those specific sites and start to uh, mass and, and discuss those ideas as well. So um, I'm excited. <laughs> I can't wait for us to uh, really, really get this information out there to our users and everybody else. So as a parting thought, I'm, I'll leave the floor to you guys. Like you had mentioned, you kind of teased uh, some other concepts that you guys are working with. I hope uh, to bring you guys back to announce that as well. Cause uh, I, I think, yeah, I think you guys are definitely a firm that's forward thinking and always trying to kind of bring fresh ideas uh, uh, to the marketplace. But yeah, I'll just leave it to either uh, David or Marissa. Uh, anything you want to kind of part with or share or kind of uh, uh, floor is yours. <laughs> well, I, I guess the only thing I would say is, one, well, first, thank you very much for, for having us. It's always fun to talk with you, John, and um, we're excited about this um, this new arrangement also. Um, but for anybody that's watching, um, go to ktgy.com. Um, all of these R&D um, 
concepts are on our website, um, including this one now. So um, if anybody wants to dive into any of this, and we've got, I don't know, Marissa, how many concepts are on there? Um, a couple dozen. Oh, goodness, maybe 20-ish. Yeah. Oh, wow. <laughs> so, and, so, yeah, so we're, we're always looking for new ways to look at how housing might be more attainable or serve a demographic that maybe is underserved at the moment and, and just looking at all different kinds of, of R&D concepts and, and how we can do our job better. Yeah, we've got concepts on there about repurposing parking garages with shipping containers and um, agri-hoods that uh, focus on um, uh, community gardens and other, other just you know, the, the buildings of the future. Um, so yeah, I encourage anybody to go on there and take a look at that, including, and, and the website has uh, obviously our portfolio of work that we do other places too, but I think um, um, that's the most exciting piece of the, of the website is the R&D portion. So, yes, um, that's awesome. So yeah, I think I mentioned this story to you, David, as well, but I, I think this partnership is going to be mutually beneficial because one of our, uh, uh, beta users that we, uh, and I'm not going to name him, but uh, from a firm and does a lot of volume, you know, just introduce him. Hey, congrats. You're, uh, we've uh, chose you for this uh, beta group. You're going to get a free constant massing and, you know, you're going to bring value to your developer clients and, and this is exciting. And the only response was, what is a KTGY? And I'm like, oh, let me, let me, have, let me have a call with you, right? So I actually spoke with him and he's like, oh, I'm like, here's the website, here's, you know, no. so. Um, <laughs> For people that don't know us, sometimes we're a radio station or a yogurt <laughs> shop or uh, several other things that, you know, it's alphabet soup with the architecture firm. So. Um, yeah, maybe this is a good way for people to get to know. Absolutely. I, I go, everybody go on ktgy.com. <laughs> they are on all our reports now. We are, um, you know, I already have ideas floating in my head, David. So we're going to have right on. conversations. Right on, right on. Those, but essentially it's good. I just want to be able to uh, kind of help you guys. Cause I think, yeah, I think all of these ideas are great. And the, the, the bottom line is that you guys are going to do well by your clients and really present a plethora of options for them, uh, you know, uh, and that's best suited maybe for, for them and also for the site. So, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm definitely going to uh, shout that uh, uh, website address out and everything else. So thank you, David. Thank you, Marissa. Thank you so much okay. for your time. Um, thank you. Yeah, look forward to uh, more conversations. And thank you, everyone, for joining us. See you next time.